Hello and welcome to Bar 10, where, as always, it's our goal to help you prepare for the bar exam 10 questions at a time. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell so you can be updated every time we upload new content. We aim to at least upload new content every day at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Let's get going with question number one. The National AIDS Prevention and Control Act is a new comprehensive federal statute that was enacted to deal with the public health crisis caused by the AIDS virus. Congress and the President were concerned that inconsistent lower court rulings with respect to the constitutionality, interpretation, and application of the statute might adversely affect or delay its enforcement and thereby jeopardize the public health. As a result, they included a provision in the statute providing that all legal challenges concerning those matters may be initiated only by filing suit directly in the United States Supreme Court. The provision authorizing direct review of the constitutionality, interpretation, or application of the statute only in the United States Supreme Court is a constitutional because it is authorized by the Article I power of the Congress to enact all laws that are necessary and proper to implement the general welfare. B. Constitutional, because Article Three provides that the jurisdiction of the United States Supreme Court is subject to such exceptions and such regulations as Congress shall make. C. Unconstitutional, because it denies persons who wish to challenge the statute the equal protection of the laws by requiring them to file suit in a court different from that which persons who wish to challenge other statutes may file their suit. Or D, unconstitutional, because it is inconsistent with the specification in Article 3 of the original jurisdiction of the United States Supreme Court. Take 10 seconds and choose the best answer now. If you chose option D, unconstitutional because it is inconsistent with the specification in Article 3 of the original jurisdiction of the United States Supreme Court, you'd be correct. The general rule is that the Supreme Court may only hear a case after there has been a final judgment. The Supreme Court, however, has and does keep original and exclusive jurisdiction over controversies between state governments. In this case, a provision in the National AIDS Prevention and Control Act providing that all legal challenges concerning those matters may be initiated only by filing suit directly in the U.S. Supreme Court would, in essence, not meet that burden. However, under Article 3, since these actions are not controversies between state governments, the Supreme Court would be precluded from hearing these cases until after there has, in fact, been a final judgment. As such, the provision is unconstitutional because it is inconsistent with the specification in Article 3 of the original jurisdiction of the United States Supreme Court. If we look at options A and B, they're in essence similar in that they're noting the congressional power to make changes or to adjust accordingly to either A, the necessary and proper clause, or B, the jurisdictional issue with regards to exceptions that Congress may make. In essence, while they may be accurate, generally Article 3 more specifically creates the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. So as a result, in order to modify that jurisdiction, it would not be through such legislation to carve out a specific instance under which that jurisdiction may be defined or recharacterized. It would be up to the court to make those decisions. Finally, C, unconstitutional because it, designed, it just denies persons who wish to challenge a statute equal protection of the laws. In fact, it does not because it does carve out a means by which a person can bring such a claim. So as a result, it does not necessarily impinge upon an individual's rights. It does limit them by, limit, by limiting where you can file a claim. However, it does not, in fact, deny. As a result, D would be the only possible correct answer. Question number two, Darby was prosecuted for sexually abusing his 13-year-old stepdaughter, Wendy. Wendy testified to Darby's conduct. On cross-examination, defense counsel asked Wendy, isn't it true that shortly before you complained that Darby abused you, he punished you for maliciously ruining some of his phonograph records? The question is, A, proper because it relates to a possible motive for Wendy to accuse Darby falsely. B, proper because Wendy's misconduct is relevant to her character for veracity. C, improper because the incident had nothing to do with Wendy's truthfulness. Or D, improper because it falls outside of the scope of direct examination. Take 10 seconds.
If you chose option A proper because it relates to the possible motive for Wendy to accuse Darby falsely, you'd be correct. Under the federal rules of evidence, the credibility of a witness may be attacked or impeached by any party, including the party that actually in fact called them as a witness. Impeachment by evidence of bias, interest, or motive is admissible through cross-examination or extrinsic evidence. In this case, defense counsel cross-examined Wendy about whether Darby had punished her for maliciously ruining some of his records shortly before she complained about the abuse. This question impeaches Wendy by pointing out a motive for falsely accusing Darby of abusing her. As such, the question is proper because it relates to a possible motive for Wendy to accuse Darby falsely. Let's look at the three other options, B through D. B, proper, because Wendy's misconduct is relevant to her character for veracity. In fact, her character would not be relevant here. It would be more so relevant the fact that she might have a motive for lying or telling an untruth. That would seemingly be more appropriate and better impeachment evidence nonetheless, because it would be directly related to the crime or the allegations made. C, improper, because the incident had nothing to do with Wendy's truthfulness. That would be something that should be permitted for the jury to make a decision, not the judge on a motion. D, improper, because it falls outside of the scope of direct examination. We're unclear that it does, and it clearly, in fact, to a degree, does not, because it is, in essence, impeaching the statement that the witness directly made during direct examination. So as a result, A would be the only appropriate answer here. Question number three, Palco was being treated by a physician for asbestosis, an abnormal chest condition that was caused by his on-the-job handling of materials containing asbestos. His physician has told him that the asbestosis is not presently cancerous, but that it considerably increases the risk that he will ultimately develop lung cancer. Palco bought an action for damages based on strict product liability against the supplier of the materials that contained asbestos. The court in this jurisdiction has ruled against recovery of damages for negligently inflicted emotional distress in the absence of physical harm. If the supplier is subject to liability to Palco for damages, should the award include damages for emotional distress he has suffered arising from his knowledge of the increased risk that he will develop lung cancer? Option A, no, because Palco's emotional distress did not cause his physical condition. B, no, unless the court in this jurisdiction recognizes a cause of action for an increased risk of cancer. C, yes, because the supplier of a dangerous product is strictly liable for the harm it causes. Or D, yes, because Palco's emotional distress arises from bodily harm caused by his exposure to asbestos. Take 10 seconds and choose the best answer now. If you, if you chose option D, you'd be correct, yes, because Palco's emotional distress arises from bodily harm caused by his exposure to asbestos. When a plaintiff is physically harmed, they may recover for all emotional or mental suffering that results from the physical impact without having to prove the elements for intentional or negligent infliction of emotional distress. In this case, we're told to assume that the supplier is subject to liability to Palco for damages caused by his exposure to asbestos. The question turns on whether the emotional distress Palco has suffered from his knowledge of the increased risk that he will develop lung cancer can be included in his award for damages based on strict product liability. Because Palco's emotional suffering results from the physical harm he suffered by being exposed to asbestos, damage for emotional distress will be included in his award. Here, please remember that while the question seems to make the cancer the ultimate potential harm, and note that he has not received such a diagnosis, the fact that there has been a physical impact is actually the reason or the point on which this question turns. The plaintiff here was in fact impacted as he uh, was diagnosed with a different condition noted as asbestosis. So he in fact did already have a physical impact regardless of the cancer and whether it comes or it doesn't come. Now, if you look at option A, no, because Palco's emotional distress did not cause his physical condition. This actually inverts the situation. It is the physical condition or the physical impact which should cause the emotional distress, not vice versa. So as a result, we can eliminate A right off the bat. B, no one unless the court in this jurisdiction recognizes a cause of action for an increased risk of cancer. 
The Again, B misses the point. The issue realistically is, is there a physical impact or physical harm? Yes, there is. There's a diagnosis for asbestosis. Once there is that physical harm that carries with it every and all possible emotional distress claims. C, yes, because the supplier of a dangerous product is strictly liable for the harm it causes. C is a bit overly simplistic. While that is generally accurate, there, of course, are exceptions to that rule. So as a result, D would be the most appropriate response. Question number four. John asked Doris to spend a weekend with him at his apartment, promised her they would get married on the following Monday. Doris agreed and also promised John that she would not tell anyone of their plans. Unknown to Doris, John had no intention of marrying her. After Doris came to his apartment, John told Doris he was going for cigarettes. He called Doris's father and told him that he had his daughter and that he would kill her if he did not receive $100,000. John was arrested on Sunday afternoon when he went to pick up the $100,000. Doris was still at the apartment and knew nothing of John's attempt to get the money. John is guilty of A. Kidnapping B. Attempted kidnapping C. Kidnapping or attempted kidnapping, but not both or D, neither kidnapping nor attempted kidnapping. Take 10 seconds and choose the best answer. If you chose option D, neither kidnapping nor attempted kidnapping, you'd be correct. Remember, kidnapping is the false imprisonment that involves movement of a person or concealment of a person in an undisclosed location. Attempted is the specific intent to complete a crime along with substantial steps taken towards completing that crime. In this case, Doris was never unlawfully confined, so she was not kidnapped. She was free to leave John's apartment at any time. Further, she had consented to spending the weekend at his apartment. As for attempted kidnapping, John never had the specific intent to commit kidnapping. So as a result, he could not be guilty of attempted kidnapping either. Question number five. On July 18th, Snowco, a shovel manufacturer, received an order for the purchase of 500 snow shovels from Acme Inc., a wholesaler. Acme had mailed the purchase order on July 15th. The order required shipment of the shovels no earlier than September 15th and no later than October 15th. Typed conspicuously across the front of the order form was the following. Acme Inc. reserves the right to cancel this order at any time before September 1st. Snowco's mailed response saying we accept your order was received by Acme on July 21st. As of July 22nd, which of the following is an accurate statement as to whether a contract was in fact formed? A. No contract was formed because of Acme's reservation of the right to cancel. B. No contract was formed because Acme's order was only a revocable offer. C. A contract was formed, but prior to September 1st, it was terminable at the will of either party. Or D. A contract was formed, but prior to September 1st, it was an option contract terminable only at the will of Acme. Take 10 seconds and choose what you believe to be the best answer now. If you chose option A, no contract was formed because of Acme's reservation of the right to cancel, you'd be correct. Remember, a valid contract requires an offer, acceptance, consideration, and no defenses to formation. The rule is that illusory promises cannot be considered as consideration. In this case, Acme's order stated that Acme reserved the right to cancel the order at any time before September 1st. As such, Acme's promise is still illusory as of July 22nd, so no contract has in fact been formed up until that point. Question number six, the state of Erewhon has a statute providing that an unsuccessful candidate in a primary election for a party's nomination for elected public office may not become a candidate for the same office at the following general election by nominating petition or by write-in votes. Sable sought her party's nomination for governor in the May primary election. After losing in the primary, Sable filed nomination petitions containing the requisite number of signatures to become a candidate for the office of governor in the following general election. The chief elections officer of Erwan refused to certify Sable's petition solely because of the above statute. 
Sable then filed suit in federal district court challenging the constitutionality of this Erewhon statute. As a matter of constitutional law, which of the following is the proper burden of persuasion in this suit? A. Sable must demonstrate that the statute is not necessary to achieve a compelling state interest. B. Sable must demonstrate that the statute is not rationally related to a legitimate state interest. C. The state must demonstrate that the statute is the least restrictive means of achieving compelling state interest. Or D. The state must demonstrate that the statute is rationally related to a legitimate state interest. Take 10 seconds and choose your answer now. If you chose option C, the state must demonstrate the statute is the least restrictive means of achieving a compelling state interest, you'd be correct. The Equal Protections Clause of the 14th Amendment applies equal protection to the states. Equal protection is invoked when a law treats one person or class of persons differently from others. Equal protection provides that all citizens must be offered the equal protection of the laws. The Supreme Court has held that equal protection applies to state laws regulating the selection of candidates for public office because such laws burden the rights to associate and to cast votes effectively. Ballot restrictions are reviewed under strict scrutiny, which means that a state must have a compelling interest in limiting ballot access and may only do so by the least restrictive means necessary to achieve that compelling state interest. A review under strict scrutiny puts the burden of proof on the government. In this case, Sable was prevented from becoming a candidate for governor because of the Erewhon statute that limits ballot access. This ballot restriction violates Sable's equal protection rights. The statute makes it impossible for a person to run for office if the person first loses a party nomination for that office. It effectively limits the potential for people to run for office as independents and also limits the ability for people to cast votes effectively. Such ballot restrictions are subject to strict scrutiny. Therefore, as a matter of constitutional law, Erwan must demonstrate that the statute is the least restrictive means of achieving a compelling state interest. Question number seven. Paul sued Dyer for personal injuries sustained when Dyer's car hit Paul, a pedestrian. Immediately after the accident, Dyer got out of his car, raced over to Paul, and said, Don't worry, I'll pay your hospital bill. Paul's testimony concerning Dyer's statement is A. Admissible because it is an admission of liability by a party opponent. B. Admissible because it is within the excited utterance exception of the hearsay rule. C. Inadmissible to prove liability because it is an offer to pay medical expenses or D, inadmissible, provided that Dyer kept his promise to pay Paul's medical expenses. Take 10 seconds. If you chose option C, inadmissible, to prove liability because it is an offer to pay medical expenses, you'd be correct. The rule is that evidence of payments or an offer to pay medical expenses is inadmissible to prove liability for injuries in question, but related statements are still admissible. In this case, Dyer's statement to Paul, don't worry, I'll pay your medical expenses, is an offer to pay medical expenses and bills and therefore is inadmissible to prove liability. However, do not forget, it can still come in under other pretenses and to prove other matters. So for example, if there is a claim later that the statement was not made and that an individual, the defendant did not make the statement to promise to pay the bill, then theoretically in a civil claim that could be presented as evidence to show in fact that he did make a commitment to pay this bill. Question number eight. Owen owned Greenacre, a tract of land in Fee Simple. By warranty deed, he conveyed Greenacre to Laffey for life, and from and after the death of Laffey to Rem, her heirs and assigned. Subsequently, Rem died, devising all of her estate to Dan. Rem was survived by Hannah, her sole heir at law. Shortly thereafter, Laffey died. Survived by Owen, Dan, and Hannah, titled to Greenacre is now in... A. Owen, because the contingent remainder was never vested, and Owen's reversion was entitled to possession immediately upon Laffey's death. B. Dan, because the vested remainder in Rem was transmitted by her will. C. Hannah, because she is Rem's heir. Or D. Either Owen or Hannah, depending upon which 
uh, the destructibility of contingent remainders is recognized in the applicable jurisdiction. Take 10 seconds to choose the best answer. If you chose option B, Dan, because the vested remainder in REM was transmitted by her will, you'd be correct. A life estate is the lifetime ownership of land. A simple life estate is a life estate that is measured by the life of the grantee. The future interest of a life estate is a reversion to the grantor unless assigned to a third party remainder. A remainder is a future interest created in, the, in a grantee upon termination of a prior state of known fixed duration. For example, to B for life, then to C, then to C. Grants a life estate to B and C holds a vested remainder. Vested remainders are created in an ascertained person and not subject to any condition precedent. Remainders are freely divisible, freely descendable, and freely alienable. Here, Owen conveyed a life estate in Greenacre to Laffey and the remainder to Rem. Rem's remainder is vested because Rem was identifiable and there was no condition precedent for the remainder to take effect other than the termination of Laffey's life estate. When Rem died and all of her estate was devised to Dan, her vested remainder also passed to Dan. When Laffey died, Greenacre's title went to Dan in fee simple. Therefore, title to Greenacre now is in Dan because the vested remainder in Rem was transmitted by her will. Question number nine. In an action brought against Driver by Walker's legal representative, the only proofs that the legal representative offered on liability were that one, Walker, a pedestrian, was killed instantly while walking on the shoulder of the highway. Two, driver was driving the car that struck Walker. And three, there were no living witnesses to the accident other than driver who denied negligence. Assume the jurisdiction has adopted a rule of pure comparative negligence. If at the end of the plaintiff's case, driver moves for a directed verdict, the trial judge should a. Grant the motion because the legal representative have, has offered no specific evidence from which reasonable jurors may conclude that the driver was in fact negligent. B. Grant the motion because it is just as likely that Walker was negligent as that driver was negligent. C. Deny the motion unless Walker was walking with his back to traffic in violation of the state highway code. Or D. Deny the motion because in the circumstances negligence on the part of the driver may be inferred. Take 10 seconds and choose your best answer. I hope you chose option D. D would be the correct option. D, the, deny the motion because in the circumstances, negligence on the part of the driver may be inferred. Remember, to prove prima facie negligence, you must show a duty, breach of that duty, causation, and damages. The doctrine of res ipsa loquitur applies when the plaintiff does not have direct evidence of the defendant's negligence conduct. In order for res ipsa loquitur to apply, there must be no direct evidence as to the defendant's precise conduct. The accident must not normally occur without negligence by someone, and the defendant must be the most likely person whose negligence would have caused the accident. A judge may not issue a directed verdict if, based on the facts of the case, the judge believes the burden of proof for an issue in question has been satisfied. In this case, Walker's legal representative cannot show direct evidence as to driver's conduct because Walker is in fact dead. However, a car does not normally hit someone walking on the shoulder of a highway without a driver's negligence. Driver, being the one in control of the car that struck Walker, was the most likely person whose negligence would have caused the accident. A directed verdict in this case is not proper because a reasonable jury may find that driver was in fact negligent under the doctrine of res ipsa loquitur. Even if Walker was also negligent, comparative negligence allows for Walker's estate to recover a reduced amount based on the attributed percentage of his negligence. Therefore, the trial judge should deny the motion because, in the circumstances, negligence on the part of driver may be inferred. Let's look at the three other options and analyze those. Option A, grant the motion because the legal representative has offered no specific evidence from which reasonable jurors may conclude that driver was negligent. A is ignoring the in its entirety the option of res ipsa loquitur, so we can remove it 
and as such, it was not a viable option. B, grant the motion because it is just as likely that Walker was negligent as that driver was negligent. Well, the facts don't seem to support that. However, given the fact that this is a pure comparative negligence jurisdiction, uh, we would take into account any liability on the part of the victim or the decedent, and as a result, simply limit his expo the exposure of the defendant. So B would not be or could not be an appropriate option. C, deny the motion unless Walker was walking with his back to traffic in violation of the state highway code. While this is not in the fact pattern whatsoever, again, it goes into the idea of comparative negligence. And as a result, it should not be a basis or could not be a basis for a directed verdict. As a result, D would be the only possible correct outcome. And our final question of this grouping, question number 10. In order to provide funds for a system of new major airports near the 10 largest cities in the United States, Congress levies a tax of $25 on each airline ticket issued in the United States. The tax applies to every airline ticket, even those for travel that does not originate in, terminate at, or pass through any of those 10 large cities. As applied to the issuance of the United States of an airline ticket for travel between two cities, that will not be served by any of the new airports. This tax is a constitutional because Congress had, has broad discretion in choosing the subjects of its taxation and may impose taxes on subjects that have no relation to the purpose for which those tax funds will be expended. B, constitutional because an exemption for the issuance of tickets for travel between cities that will not be served by the new airports would deny the purchasers of all other tickets the equal protection of the laws. C, unconstitutional, because the burden of the tax outweighs its benefits for passengers whose travel does not originate in, terminate at, or pass through any of the 10 largest cities. Or option D, unconstitutional, because the tax adversely affects the fundamental right to travel. Take 10 seconds and choose the best option now. If you chose option A, constitutional, because Congress has broad discretion in choosing the subjects of its taxation and may impose taxes on subjects that have no relation to the purpose for which those tax funds will be expended, you'd be correct. Congress has the power to tax for the general welfare and taxes will be upheld if the taxes bear some reasonable relationship to revenue production or if Congress has independent authority to regulate the activity being taxed. Congress may spend to provide for the common defense and general welfare. Here, Congress levied a tax on each airline ticket issued in the United States. This act is well within Congress's taxing power. Congress will then provide the tax revenue as funding for a system of new major airports near the 10 largest cities in the United States. This act is, again, also well within Congress's spending power. There's nothing in the Constitution prohibiting Congress from taxing one subject in order to spend on another subject. Therefore, the tax is constitutional because Congress has broad discretion in choosing the subjects of its taxation and may impose taxes on subjects that have no relation to the purpose for which these tax funds will be expended. Let's analyze the other three options now. If we look at option B, constitutional because an exemption for the issuance of tickets for travel between cities that will not be served by the new airports would deny the purchasers of all other tickets the equal protection of laws. This is the epitome of assuming facts, not in evidence. So the reality here is it's saying it's constitutional because if they limited it only to the people that would be traveling, utilizing the airports, it would then be unfair and deny equal protection of the laws. So the issue with B is that it uses perverse logic and in essence, it inverts the burden. C, unconstitutional because the burden of tax outweighs its benefit for passengers whose travel does not originate in, terminate at, or pass through any of the 10 largest cities. Again, this is irrelevant because, in fact, the Congress is permitted to make these taxations. And, for example, it regularly does. As there are commonly taxes on travel, which the utilization of those taxes, it's unclear that it benefits every single user. It's not required that the tax 
uh, the monies that arise from the taxation benefit every single user or every single individual being taxed. That would be an unrealistic expectation. Finally, D, unconstitutional because the tax adversely affects the fundamental right to travel. If you recall, in essence, the right to travel between states is uh, a limitation of the states. They cannot issue uh, any legislation or any rules or any laws that would impact the right to travel between states. And even under those circumstances, that limitation has to have some discriminatory basis. Here, we have a regulation that is, in fact, broad spread to every traveling individual within the United States, the entirety of the country. There can be no regulation that is less discriminatory than that. As always, thank you for joining us on Bar 10, where it's our goal to help you prepare for the bar exam 10 questions at a time. To that end, we upload content every single day at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and sometimes quite a bit more than that. So please like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell so you can be updated every time we upload new content to help you prepare for this exam.